We haven't for the last two years because the state entomologist has told us that uh, they thought it was under control. And then they went out and checked the hot spots, and of course we have to be in a hot spot. Cumberland has kind of had a hard time getting rid of it like other communities. Falmouth is basically done with brown tail moth. And do we know what, um, you mentioned every 10 years, and I don't know if that's an exact number, but something that they, they, they don't go away forever, but maybe they got, come in phases where, you know, for a 10 year period, it's, or two or three year period, it's really bad. Do we know where we are on that swell? We're at the end of this infestation period, so we should start seeing it again with a massive infestation, probably in the seven to eight more years again. So okay. we're, we've, we're about two years from it, the 10 years of just awfulness is almost over. Do we have any indication to think that if we did assist in spraying in this area that this would kind of finalize the, 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 the overwhelming uh, presence of them in Cumberland as this continues to move west and no? Uh, the, the problem, the reason I shake my head is because we can't reach them all. You know what I'm saying? Uh, as Mike pointed out, the last time we did this we had a bunch of opt-outs and you look and they're big X marks on the road for the truck to skip over until the next property and that whole section could be infest, you know, infested. And when you allow those to continue, they basically come out, feed, build more cocoons next year and they just continue to get bigger and uh, they continue to grow more nests. Uh, if we could eradicate the nest, uh, there's a gentleman, um, I think he's in Yarmouth, that basically does, the, does this aerially. He goes in with a lift and basically clips all the nests and burns the nest. That would be great. Then we'd know the nests were gone. But uh, that's, that's very uh, labor intensive and uh, the spraying just can get to a lot more nests in a very shorter period, much shorter period of time. Uh, on the fourth side, I will say we got some relief. We didn't cure the problem. And the ironic part, Mark, about this was, if, if my history is correct, we had a chance in the state to fully eradicate it. It was limited to a couple islands. The state said, no, it will never go to the mainland. And they never did it. They never went out there and sprayed, and that would have taken care of the problem. But now it's, it's all over. What, what do, was the number that you suggested might be the, to? Uh, uh, we were doing it for $20,000 a year in the past. We, we don't, we only have about five miles of roadway that we're going to basically be able to cover if we can cover that much. And I would uh, probably focus on Pleasant Valley and Greeley Road Extension. If you look at a map, that's straight through, uh, you know, straight through the corridor where all the, uh, um, uh, infestation is right now. I think, unfortunately, like everything else, the side streets are going to be if we can get to them. I don't know if we're going to find a contractor this late in the game that would help us. So, uh, Whitney said they would do the best they can to give us some time, but they couldn't guarantee two days. Is, uh, I, I, I won't speak for the council, but I'll speak for myself. I think you should uh, see what you can get. Uh, you know, I have a consensus. Uh, I think it would be a waste of $20,000 personally. Um, I have had this every year. I live on the Mill Road in West Cumberland, which is canopied with nothing but oak trees. Um, I think this piecemealing is not working. We have spent thousands of dollars now, and it hasn't done very much good. It certainly has helped some people, but not all of the people of Cumberland. And I think with this hodgepodge spraying around that it just I think we could find a better way to spend twenty thousand dollars, so. and not. I don't want people to think that I. I just if we can't do it for all, we shouldn't be doing it. Is the way I look at it. Mike hit it right on the head. When we skip over these property owners, we're just oh, yeah. no, I, kicking the can down the road. Do we have any indication on, in this area how many of these property owners? I guess you said me, technically we have the right of way, right? That we can we can spray in that area. But do we have any indication from any of these property owners how many of them would opt out if spraying were, was occurring? We, we haven't even started yet, Mark. In the past, we've started this in January and had the neighborhood meetings. And uh, by February, we kind of knew who was in or out. Um, uh, 
Abby, who was here, did she leave? She just <laughs> left, just stepped out. Uh, she was the one who's been coordinating the program for me the last two times we did it, and she would take all the phone calls and give me the properties that we'd have to go mark out on a Saturday to say they're in or out. So uh, we're squeezing about three months of work into about three weeks of time. So it's, it, it, is, it isn't easy. My wife is highly allergic to it. Uh, it's it's awful, Bob. It is, yes. And uh, she's got a tree on the chopping block that I don't want to cut down, but she's <laughs> you're, you're, you're cutting that down this year. Happy it's, wife, happy life. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I have seen on social media that more and more property owners are are taking responsibility for their own trees and they're doing injections into their trees to help um, prevent the infestations. And I think, you know, really a collaborative residential effort is probably the best approach. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have any consensus here. And I guess to where to leave it is um, if there is a uh, an opening, let us know about it. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. Work uh, we, <laughs> we we would have way too much work to do if if the council. I mean, we can stick to the past policy and, and leave it at that. Uh, it might be too late anyway to get all the notifications out. I mean, we're almost into April, and you know, we're getting ready to spray, you know, by mid to late April. So, okay. Abby, quick question. Yes. When we were doing the foresight, how many opt-outs you had? Do you remember? You remember? I don't remember off the top of my head. Quite a few. Perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. There were quite a few people that didn't want it. 20, 26, because I had to paint them all. So, <laughs> so I had some orange boots to prove it. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, public discussion is the next item on the. Is that all you had? Apparently, yes. So I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm not cutting you off. <laughs> uh, the next item on the agenda is, is public discussion. And public discussion is for comments on items that are not on the agenda. Comments are limited to five minutes per person. Rebuttal comments will be limited to two minutes. Public discussion topics may be brought up again under new business for further council discussion. Is there anyone here this evening who would like to address the town council? Seeing none. Uh, legislation and policy. Item 22-030, to hold a presentation regarding the senior property tax refer deferral program. This is something that the council has been working on uh, for quite a while. Mark Seacrest is the author of a piece of legislation and uh, I think that uh, I will hand it over to Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if it's okay with you, I have a kind of prepared statement here to make sure that I don't miss any of the details that we've gone over over the last couple months. So with your permission, I'd like to read that. Um, this is an update on the Senior Property Tax Deferral Program. For many years, the Town Council has heard from seniors in our community that while they do not mind paying their fair share in taxes, they are concerned that given their fixed income, they will one day be unable to keep up with the ever-increasing cost of property taxes, potentially forcing them to sell the homes that they've lived in for decades and to leave the community they love. Hearing these concerns, we on the current Town Council have been working diligently over the past nine months to deliver meaningful property tax relief to lower-income seniors in our community, specifically by creating a senior property tax deferral pilot program, which, if implemented, would permit the Town of Cumberland to defer the payment of a qualifying resident's incremental property taxes until such time as they pass away, sell or transfer the property, or no longer utilize the property as their primary residence. This effectively would freeze their property taxes at their current baseline level. We believe that such a program is not only critical to ensuring that Cumberland seniors are able to age in place with dignity and respect, but also to contribute financially to town services. In working to create such a program, which we understand may be uh, the only one of its kind in the state of Maine, I, along with a select group of counselors, have been working closely and collaboratively with the town manager, town staff, and town attorney 
to research current state taxation and foreclosure laws and to develop draft ordinance language for the full council's review. However, in a recent meeting with the town attorney, we learned that given the state's current law on property taxation and foreclosures, we are likely unable to implement such a program at this time without assuming considerable and unnecessary financial exposure, something neither I nor my fellow counselors feel would be financially prudent as stewards of town resources. Allow me to provide some additional legal context. We understand that under Maine law, municipalities such as Cumberland have the authority to assess and collect real estate taxes, but the Maine legislature maintains sole taxation authority. In other words, municipalities like Cumberland cannot apportion, abate, or exempt property taxes other than as expressly authorized by the Maine legislature. Now, thankfully, in the case of this program, Maine law does currently authorize municipalities to adopt a property tax deferral program for seniors, specifically setting forth municipal authority to adopt such a program, taxpayer eligibility requirements for participation, the triggering events under which deferred property taxes must be repaid, and critically, the process by which a municipality can enforce its lien on property taxes deferred under such a program. What's important here, however, is that that statute's enabling legislation, which was passed in 2009, included an amendment to Maine's underlying real estate tax lien statute, which specifies that a tax collector may only file a tax lien certificate, in other words, commence the standard tax lien foreclosure process as set forth in Maine law, following one of the four events requiring repayment, namely, if the taxpayer dies, they transfer or sell the property, or they no longer occupy the property as a principal place of residence. So in other words, the 2009 amendment that I mentioned earlier effectively limits a municipality's ability to commence a tax lien foreclosure process against a property where only a portion, i.e. the incremental amount, of property taxes have been deferred until one of those four previously mentioned triggering events occurred. The result is that the town would have no legal mechanism to collect the taxes due on any established baseline value, and this, um, and this could force the town to defer all property taxes, the baseline and the incremental amount, until one of those four triggering events occurred. This, as I previously discussed, could subject the town to considerable and unnecessary financial exposure, making such a program, in my opinion, currently unfeasible given the current language of the state law. So what can be done about it? After speaking with the town manager and town attorney and other fellow counselors, we believe that a viable option and the next logical step may be to work with our elected officials in the Maine State Legislature to propose amendments to sections 941 and 942 of Title 36 to allow municipalities to define for themselves, additional events requiring the repayment of deferred taxes, so for example, the taxpayer fails to pay a baseline or incremental tax amount, or also to commence the tax lien foreclosure process as it relates solely to taxes due on an established baseline value. We believe that such a change would be needed to adequately preserve the town's ability to collect taxes under the standard provisions of Maine law in the context of an incremental property tax deferral program. Additionally, from a policy perspective, we believe that amendments to, sections six, to section 6271 expressly authorizing municipalities to defer less than all of the property taxes due and to establish additional criteria for taxpayer eligibility under municipal property tax deferral programs would likely result in more widespread adoption of such programs throughout the state. It would, therefore, Mr. Chairman, be my recommendation that we work with our elected officials in the Maine State Legislature to pursue these amendments over the coming months, as I am hopeful that with these amendments, we will be able to provide better and more meaningful property tax assistance to the low-income seniors in our community who need it most. Thank you very much, and that's all I have. So it appears that we are cutting edge, that this is a, um, we are the first community in the state to move such a program forward. Um, I think it's, a, uh, it's been admirable work by all those involved with it. Uh, it's a significant step forward for uh, helping our seniors stay in their homes. Uh, all of us have uh, had one form or another had uh, uh, 
uh, an idea of aging in place, and this is just another uh, tool in, in the toolbox. Uh, I did ask Mr. Moriarty, our state representative, to come this evening, and uh, more or less as a informational for him to hear what we had to say, uh, and uh, I will offer him the opportunity to speak with us if he so desires. Uh, it looks like he's going to take advantage of that opportunity. Mr. Moriarty. Bob, I've uh, never turned you down so far, I don't, <laughs> I don't believe. Uh, I am uh, masked up tonight, folks, because, as you can probably tell, I have a cold. I got it with my grandson last weekend, and I learned that when you're not around little kids a lot, I, as I told Bill and Mark today, you lose all of these immunities and resistances that you would build up as when you were parents, and I have nothing, you know, I just, I got nailed by my little grandson, so uh, things are getting better, though. Um, so I heard about this program today for the first time, and I think it's a great uh, idea. Um, but let me just tell you about what I think the path forward ought to be. First of all, <coughs> we're uh, just over two weeks, sorry, just over three weeks away from adjournment. There's nothing you can do in this current second session of the, of the current legislature. It's way too late. Uh, we're wrapping up as opposed to taking on major new projects. So what you ought to do is uh, think about the long run and make plans for the first session of the next legislature, which will start in uh, uh, January of, uh, of 23. Um, and as I understand Mark's explanation, you're talking about amending two sections in Title 36. Uh, that alone is, is, uh, uh, is, a, is a good thing because it's so much easier to tweak existing language than it is to try to pass a whole new law uh, altogether. Um, and and the, the tweaks that Mark described, as, as I heard them, are really rather minor in nature and almost uh, self-explanatory and probably very appealing to a lot of communities around the state. So that's, I think, the, the job you have to do is not all that uh, difficult. But what I uh, suggest that you do is take advantage of the following uh, months of this year to plan for the next session of the, uh, of the uh, <coughs> legislature. So, um, as I said, we're adjourning on April 20, but your current legislative delegation, Senator Breen and myself, are in office or remain in office until the new legislators uh, are sworn in in December following the November election day. Now, we know that Senator Breen is not running for re-election because she can't. I am running for re-election, but no one knows what the outcome of that will be. In either event, uh, Senator Breen and I are still on the job, technically speaking, all the way through early December. So, um, and once we go out of uh, active session, uh, the workload drops down dramatically. So we have a lot of time to work together with you in crafting a plan for amending these sections of the of Title 36 that Mark uh, mentioned. And you can also, during that time period, during the summer months and the early fall months, uh, touch base with the uh, Maine Bureau of Taxation and get them on board and answer any questions they may have uh, or listen to any concerns they may have. So that when the new legislature comes into session in December, you can be prepared after having worked with the town attorney as well, to offer draft legislation fully written out um, for introduction into the, into the first session of the next legislature. Uh, neither Kathy nor I could legally do that because our terms expire before the opening day of the submission of new legislation. So you've got to wait till the, the new team is sworn in, so to speak, on, in early December. But you can have all the homework done ahead of time. You can have something drafted and reviewed and vetted and scanned. And so you give it to the, the reviser in the State House, and, and all the, the heavy lifting is done. And so it just progresses to the normal course, which is you uh, obtain a, somebody who's the lead sponsor, someone who's the lead co-sponsor, and several other people sign on as, as ordinary sponsors. It would <coughs> excuse me get referred to the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Taxation, and they would then hold a public hearing and a work session and so forth, 
at some point between January and June of 2023. And hopefully it would be enacted uh, during that first session. Hopefully it would be signed by the governor. And uh, unless it's passed as emergency legislation, it would take effect 90 days after the legislature adjourns late next June, June of 23. If you did choose to try to get it passed as an emergency bill, it takes effect 90 days from the date on which the governor signs, if the governor signs. So you can, you can accelerate the effective date by getting something passed as an emergency. The trick there is it takes two-thirds of both houses to get something passed as an emergency as opposed to a simple majority. Um, so there are some downsides to that. Um, but you've got all the time in the world to really, uh, to really uh, you know, bear down on this and, and do the, the, what we call the deep dive and, uh, and get something lined up in writing for presentation to your new delegation when the time comes in, uh, in December. Good to see you tonight, Steve. You too, Mike. Is there, is there an appetite, in your opinion, by the legislature to tweak taxation laws or to support more local control? Absolutely. Every, every time you uh, raise the issue of uh, aging in place, for example, and, and uh, allowing people to continue to live in the homes that they have uh, uh, lived in for decades or, or whatever, uh, that's, that is a uh, very, very popular idea. The trick is in coming up with a mechanism that makes that possible. And what you've developed uh, is really, uh, really interesting. And, and Bill explained it to me briefly this morning. You take sort of a base level of taxation, which uh, you continue to charge because they can afford it, but, uh, but the year-by-year -year increase in the taxable value is, uh, is deferred. Mm until there's a sale or, or transfer or whatever. And I mean, that, that just hits all, that, that hits all the right notes. I mean, nobody's gonna argue with that. Uh, the towns and the cities are guaranteed of, of ultimate recovery of their, of their tax entitlement. At the same time, they preserve the ability of their citizens to stay and live in their homes at a rate at which they can afford being somewhat insulated from the uh, appreciation and value that ev the rest of us younger folks have to uh, have to face. So yeah, I think I think you'd find real fertile ground for that one. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, a follow-up question, Steve. You you mentioned that you as a legislature can't legislators can't do anything to uh, offer up legislation, but I wonder if it might be helpful if we had. If there is such an individual, uh, the commissioner of of, uh, of uh, taxation, to have him come down and we make a presentation to him oh. and, and start l laying the groundwork for the, so that this doesn't come as a surprise to the the administrators administration people. Um. Absolutely, that's why I was saying you have you have months in which to do all this uh, uh, legwork and homework, so to speak, all the preparatory work. And that should involve somebody from the Bureau of Taxation so they're not caught unawares or by surprise because when uh, the gates open in early December and everybody files their bills, and by the way, there's no limit on the number of new bills that can be filed in the first se session, so 1,600, 1,800 bills is not an uncommon figure. Um, and something as important as this can get lost in that sort of uh, flood. So you want to take advantage and, and you know, tip people off ahead of time and let them know your thoughts. Take, take their input, revise your proposal if necessary, so that when uh, the gates open, you're ready to hit the ground running. When we met with the town attorney this week, she also suggested that we um, use Maine Municipal Association to the best of our ability. We don't engage yes. them very often, and this would be something that we could really Absolutely. get some support. Well, sure. Of, of course. And of course, they have their legislative policy committee. Right. They can begin to run up by them. And if you get them on your side, as I think almost certainly you would, then you're, you're in good shape. Yeah. Yeah. Really good shape. Not to burden you anymore, but perhaps a short piece of homework for you is to give us a, a, a list of things that we should, we should get to work on. Well, um, <coughs> I'm not 
completely sure how far you've gotten so far. Clearly, uh, Mark implied that there's been a, a subcommittee that's done some, some work. So uh, whether you're, you're finished with that or not, I, I, I don't really know. But I would suggest that uh, 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 there's somebody at Jensen Baird who probably specializes in taxation as part of municipal law and get them on board and, and do, do some drafting. And, and do get your, your ordinance committee meeting with them and, and coming up with something that's, uh, that looks to be good. And then I would take it to an official from the Bureau of Taxation, set up a meeting. They may come down here or you may take a road trip up there and just you know, plant the seed and just say, this is what we have in mind. We'd like to know your feedback, your thoughts, get some reaction from you. And, and, and if we need to uh, do some revisions, we're happy to consider that. So that when early December finally rolls around, you see you will have done all the preparation work that's required. And it won't come as a surprise to the, uh, the state employees in the Bureau who will be dealing with this and assessing its potential impact on a statewide basis. So you, uh, you, know, you get out there early, but it's, it's technically not official because neither Kathy nor I, in the remaining months of 2022, can offer a new bill. It just, under the Constitution, that can't be done. And I would just add, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of what can, what we've done to date, I think we've done a lot of heavy lifting with the town staff and town manager and town attorney and the folks on the council. We've had a lot of workshops, a lot of back end reviews on spreadsheets after spreadsheets as to what the financial impact on a town would be. Um, we've actually got draft ordinance language ready to go. Right. Um, and so it, I think it's it's pretty much in the can. We have PowerPoint presentations on what the program is, how many people we were thinking, graphs in terms of uh, what the average uh, property tax rates are, what the average property tax payments are, what the average deferred amount would be, right. and what the financial impact on our town would be. Um, so I think we're really just at the point where um, we just didn't feel comfortable moving forward with the ordinance as drafted, given this potential well, I, challenge. Well, I, I agree. Uh, there's no point in, in uh, going the full distance on the ordinance if there's some question as to your statutory authority to do it in the first place. So what's going to be most interesting, or rather of most concern to the people at, Bureau, uh, at the Bureau of Taxation is not so much what Cumberland's ordinance is going to look like, but rather what the state statute is going to look like. Mm -hmm because that means that all 550, uh, 450 plus cities and towns in the state can do the same thing, basically. And they need to assess the impact of that. And if there's any unforeseen problems or, or whatever, there's plenty of time for them to scope that out between, between now and then. But your lead off point with them ought to be the statutory changes and not so much your own proposed ordinance. I think that makes sense. And, you know, I mentioned in my, my statement that I read here, there, there is a current state statute in place right. that allows towns to develop these deferral programs, but it says you can defer the taxes, and it never specifies what you mean by deferring the taxes. Sure. Are you talking about the entire tax liability amount? Or in our case, you know, we won't defer the baseline amount of, let's say, $5,000, but the additional increment of $250, that's, it's, it's ratcheted up the next year, would be deferred. Yep. Sure. And so. You know, we, we felt with our town attorney that under home rule authority, we had the, we had, if you have the authority to defer all of the taxes, then you also would have the authority to defer just a portion of the taxes. But it's a little unclear as to when we would be able to recover. Yeah. Um, and so that was just a, a little bit too much potential liability yeah, for us to stomach. It would be tough to bet the farm on that, on that approach. Um, and it doesn't surprise me to find that there's ambiguity in the statute. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's uh, endemic up there. So... <laughs> so, uh, by all means, focus on the statute, and at the same time, you can you can you know obviously uh, uh, do some uh, legwork on your own ordinance so that you're ready to respond as soon as the the law changes. But again, if it's passed as a regular measure in the first session in 2023, it would take effect in late September of 2023. So, until the state law changes you can't adopt your ordinance. So you've, you've got a lot of time to play with it as well. Shirley. I know that there are some people in TV land that expressly tuned in tonight to see what 
promises we might be able to make about tax deferral. And so I just wanted to remind you that we're still working on it, but also to let you know that you are still eligible and you should apply for the senior circuit breaker. Sure. Um, that program is still in effect and it will still provide um, a little relief. So there's nothing uh, beyond a roadmap that I can really offer you tonight, but I, I think you, you're you're well on the way to, to really achieving something good here. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. So we do have a a um, an action item on this piece of agenda uh, to um, authorize the committee to work with the legislature and whoever else needs to be involved and so uh, I guess we can uh, act on this as a, uh, a sign of that this is not going to lay dormant, that we're going to move ahead with this and we're going to uh, uh, get to work on it. So I would entertain a motion. Open the public hearing. Um, this was not listed as a public hearing but if there anyone here who would like to address the council on this matter, uh, we'll entertain uh, listening to you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll give you a motion. I move to authorize the Senior Property Tax Committee to work with our state legislatures to help enact a Cumberland Senior Tax Deferral Program. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion about this this evening? I think this is a great uh, step that we're making, uh, and it has a potential of having, uh, 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 you know, uh, a statewide benefit to to all elderly citizens. And uh, uh, I look forward to uh, having Mark and the rest of you uh, engage as legislator and the taxation committee, and uh, get us on the docket for action next year. So, anybody else? Uh, all in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would just like to thank Councilor Seagrass for all the heavy lifting on this, Mark. You have done a tremendous amount of work on this. And top notch. You really have done an outstanding job. So thank you very much. Well, yeah. thank you very much. I'd like to also pass those thanks on to the town manager and town clerk and the rest of the town staff and the town attorney and everyone on the council that's participated in these calls. So it's been a, been a team effort. Great. Thank you. Next item on our agenda this evening is item 22-031, to hold a public hearing to consider and act on amendments to Chapter 261, Taxation of the Cumberland Code, to add Article 3, Senior Property Tax Deferral Program. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I move to table. I'll second. Moved and second to table. All in favor? Motion carries. Item 22-032, to consider and act on a request from the Greater Portland Council of Governments to find housing for 700 refugee families in the Greater Portland area. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion I move the table. I'll second. Before I call for a vote, I would like to have a little bit of explanation to this, uh, to just to keep everybody in the loop and to uh, kind of give some, some background to this. As I mentioned, uh, I think it was the last meeting uh, that we had had a request from uh, the Greater Portland Council of Governments to uh, host uh, some families to uh, immigration asylum seekers. And uh, it, it has um, uh, morphed or expanded or contracted, depending on how you look at it. Uh, the need has not gone away the uh, criteria is, is a, on some level, is a moving target. Uh, the town manager and I met with uh, representatives of the uh, uh, faith communities uh, and some interested citizens about how we might, um, how we might assist in this manner. Um, so uh, to make a long story short or a long story longer, uh, I'm going to call to, for a workshop here in the next couple of weeks for the council to sit down and, and discuss this. Um, there's a, it's a unique opportunity for us to, to look at um, 
uh, certainly one of the things we could say is this is uh, this is too much of a heavy lift for this community and we can say we really can't do anything at all um, and, and that's one approach uh, the and then the other ex sort of the extreme to this thing is that we could offer to uh, a proposal to to fund a, a uh, put a bond to the voters and say we want to borrow X amount of dollars to uh, build a facility that uh, provides some some permanent temporary housing, and then there's everything in between. So the the idea that uh, I'm presenting to this evening is for us to to uh, uh, take away for the next couple weeks and think about what we as a community may have the appetite to do to assist in uh, housing for immigrants and asylum seekers. Uh, and it, it, it can be as simple as looking for available housing, uh, you know, people that might have a house that's available to rent. Uh, it could be as intensive as uh, not a tent city, but uh, uh, certainly if you look at uh, FEMA and Katrina, uh, how the federal government stepped in with temporary housing uh, to assist with families down there. Um, so there's a, there's a wide variety of opportunities and a wide variety of how we might discuss this and, and bring it forward. But uh, I do have my own ideas, and uh, I'm sure that all of you, if you had a chance to think about this, might think about uh, different ways to approach this topic. And uh, uh, what I'm looking forward in the next couple weeks is for us to get together and kind of brainstorm about how this might look in our community and uh, what the approaches that we might take. So uh, it is going to be tabled for this evening, but I believe in two weeks we will bring it back uh, in a workshop forum. Uh, I think the town manager and I will be able to have uh, some ideas that he and I have tossed around, and uh, um, it's going to be wide open discussion. Anybody else before we move the motion? Moved and seconded to table this item. All in favor? Item is tabled. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 22-033, to hold a public hearing to consider and act on a medical marijuana registered caregiver license application for Leaning Pine LLC owner Kelly Cop located at 210 Gray Road. So if we all recall, uh, recently we had a, uh, an ordinance to, uh, we drafted and adopted for the town of Cumberland as to how we would license medical, mar medical marijuana caregiver licenses. And so this is the first one that we are going to see here this evening. It has been, uh, uh, the application has been paid, the, the cost of the license, the particular authorities, code enforcement officer, planner, Police Department, Fire Department, town staff has all had a chance to review this and has brought it forward with the ought to pass, I guess. So um, I will ask, uh, I guess I'll ask the town manager first because this is a new process for us for any comments and then I'll ask for the applicant to stand. And so Mr. Manager. Well, fortunately, we have the best town clerk in the state of Maine who was on top of this. So, Tammy, <laughs> thank you. Uh, she she recon she convenes this group, uh, and she has a pretty long-standing group for every type of uh, license or application that they have meetings. Everything from mass gatherings to this being our first uh, license. So, we were pretty confident that Tammy would do a great job, and she did, and uh, brought all the team together. Uh, we are all very positive and thank you both very much for the cooperation that you put together in putting this ordinance together and putting this process together because I think in the end we we came out with a better with a better ordinance and a better licensing ordinance for this so uh, we feel it worked very well uh, this is the only application we have had to date and uh, the time is running out so how many more weeks Tammy two three <laughs> 30 days left in the original 90, 90 days to come forward and license, and then folks will be out of compliance and subject to up to $1,000 a day fine for not complying. So 
that's that would be unfortunate. We really tried to work hard to get folks in. Only one person took care, took advantage of the discount, and uh, no one else has come forward to date. So, uh, but we're very excited um, um, for uh, Leaning Pine LLC to be our first licensed. And uh, do you guys want to get up and speak? Either one of you? Do you want to just get up and slap Ron? Or yeah. okay. <laughs> that's coming. <laughs> so, that's it. Uh, I, I guess I'd have a quick question for the for uh, Tammy, uh, town clerk. Is is uh, uh, did we give you a good audience for you to be able to review properly? And uh, was there any uh, hiccups in with the staff reviewing this? And it's anything that we might have done differently or? Uh, and I don't say pat us all ourselves on the back, but. Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, I, the ordinance was, was done very, very well. Um, I, I had some um, information from other cities and towns that we used, um, which was very helpful in the process. But no, um, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of all the work that went into this um, by the town council, so thank you very much. But the process was, was very, very well, uh, well done. And I want to say thank you to Kelly and Adam. Um, they were extremely uh, pleasant to work with. They came in three times and met with me uh, and met with Mr. Longley as well. Uh, it, was, it was very, very uh, pleasant to work with them. Quick question, Bob. Oh, go ahead, sure. No, I just wanted to um, make a note that the entire application is not in our um, town council it agenda. It is not. I, I do have it with me. There are there are uh, sixty nine pages, so I didn't want to to thank you that for many. that. But I did want to let the public know that if anyone had an interest in looking at the documentation, that Correct. it is in possession of the town clerk. It's absolutely. It's on file in my office for anyone who would like to look at <clears> it. Yes. Thank you for making that note, so we all know. Tammy, uh, what other businesses do we license? We license any, uh, right now we license any DBAs d uh, doing business as home occupations. Um, there are, by state law, there are other, any, there are businesses that have to be licensed, to license like bowling alleys, um, just lo uh, businesses that we really don't have here in the town of Cumberland. Um, so as it is right now, we just very, very small businesses. Okay. And we, have, we don't have any um, businesses that we license that the licensing fee is close to 1000 bucks. No. 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 So. A, a small business license right now is $10. No. So I'll, I, I just will say this to the, the council. I, um, we knocked it down in half for this, and I think we did the right thing. Um, I would like to take a look at this again in a year uh, before they before they come up for renewal, because I don't I don't see any reason if this goes as smooth as as we think it's going to, why we're charging a thousand dollars to a local business owner. So, I, I just I just want to say in advance that I'll I'll be bringing it up and looking at it and. And I know it's, that's not your side of it, Tammy, but. I, I do, I, I will say, Mike, that I, our fees are very much in line with other cities and towns. In fact, I think that our fees are much lower than a lot of our surrounding neighbors when it comes to these licenses. Um, but certainly that's the council's decision. Great, Tammy, thank you. You're welcome. So as I said earlier, this has been reviewed by town staff. The uh, other thing that, uh, that folks should know is that all the abutters in the immediate neighborhood have been notified. Uh, they have been uh, certainly, if there's, uh, and this is a public hearing, so uh, anybody from the public who would oppose this or support it, would obviously we would expect them to be here this evening to show either cause for or against. Uh, and I guess that the next item here is to say that this is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak for or against or uh, in any manner on this subject? And again, seeing none, uh, bring it back to the council. 
uh, we have had um, the proper review, and it has been uh, auth uh, suggested that this is uh, not in contention, that it ought, ought to pass. Uh, we've had the approval from the code enforcement, the police department, the fire department, and the town clerk's office. Is there any comment, questions, concerns? Um, I will take a motion then. To Please, please. I'll give you one. I move to approve the medical marijuana registered caregiver license application for Leaning Pine LLC owner Kelly Kopp, located at 210 Gray Road. Second that. And a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. One abstention. One abstention. Oh, uh, <laughs> I thought I saw a hand over there. I was gonna Mike vote. had two up. I didn't want to vote against it, but I didn't want to vote for it because there's a little conflict. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to get yelled at. I didn't want to get slapped. <laughs> all right, the motion still carries, but it's not unanimous. I'm sure Brenda was taking notes here. Uh, next item on the agenda is 22-034, to hold a public hearing to consider and act on acceptance of the proposed Capital Improvement Plan for Fiscal Years 22 through 2027 as recommended by the Planning Board. And I think this is one that I can give to the Town Manager to bring up to speed for. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, under our charter, our, an annual Capital Improvements Plan needs to be presented to the Planning Board, uh, which we've done for many years, and usually the Planning Board looks at me and says, so what am I supposed to say? Or exactly recommend because they're not going to recommend which street to get paved or which truck to buy they're just listening uh, this year we took the opportunity to present the uh, potential project of the roundabout at the intersection of uh, skillens and route 100 and blackstrap road and there was a lot of uh, support for that uh, several nights after that, we went to the hall in West Cumberland. There were 90 people, uh, jam-packed, standing room only in there that uh, we spent two hours with, and I felt we've got a lot of great feedback and some really good questions, and I think we'll shape an application going forward that is representative and uh, well-received by the community. So uh, this year, the CIP was a little bit better than other years, but um, I think, honestly, going forward, uh, I have asked the planning board to, you know, kind of be prepared to take this opportunity to share what types of things are we not bringing forward? What types of things would they like to see uh, for capital improvements around the town so that we can get their opinions plugged in? And, you know, what's missing from the plan? Uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of items that the department heads have put in over the years that have become uh, town projects and others that are still kind of in the queue. So. Uh, I think the process works. I just think sometimes it takes a little longer than uh, some people would like to see, but it's all about funding. Uh, typically what will happen if there's an ability to gather state or federal funds for a specific project, we'll go after them and you know, hopefully they've been identified in the CIP. And if not, uh, at some time in the future, we'll try to plug them in. And that's how most of the major projects in town have gotten funded. Uh, we talk about them probably for several years before they actually do get funded. Mark. So I just have a question, and this is mostly for my own um, education here. Is this, it almost feels like something's out of order here um, in the sense of uh, sequence. I, I know tonight we had a budget meeting where we talked about a lot of these, maybe not these specific items here, but we, we're, we're still kind of formulating the budget on capital of improvement plan. And I'm wondering tonight, were we voting on something to be final though, to move forward with the proposed plan, or can you maybe address that a little bit? It's really to accept uh, a, a, the overall plan. It isn't, it isn't to fund it. There's no budgetary note attached to it. There's no amount attached to it. It's really kind of a, you know, what's on the horizon for different types of projects. Uh, I, I think it's unfortunate that our capital improvement plan and our annual budget is called a capital improvement plan. I wish it were called something else because it gets often intertwined with this one. So. Um, this is more of a planning tool than it is a finance tool, and that's, I guess, the best way I can describe it. Okay, so is there, is there anything, and that's really helpful, so is there, is there anything to preclude the council from, if we accept the plan tonight, 
from amending it or changing it in the future for one reason or another? You do every year. You do every single year. You okay. basically say, you know, by, by not funding it, it sits in a queue, and some of these things will never get funded. So um, it's really a project that's brought forward for discussion, uh, typically through the planning board, and oftentimes they don't come forward with any specific reg recommendation. It, it's an awkward process that's in a lot of town charters that really have never been uh, formulated. If we were budgeting $2 million a year toward specific pro project goals for the community that were outside of what we have to do annually from you know, paving and uh, road repairs and equipment replacement, you know, after that, whatever's left over, that's when you can say, okay, I'd like to do this or, to, or, or do that. Uh, the TIF has given us a lot more opportunities to do some of the major capital projects. But uh, before that, we were really kind of, you know, saying thank you and moving on. And that's really the best, uh, you know, the best I can tell you with, with this program. Because it really is, it's not clearly defined in the charter to say it has to do this, this, and this. But uh, it's, it's interesting to see the projects pop up. A lot of the things we've done around town have been built. The shelter, for instance, at Twinbrook was a great example. That was somebody's vision of trying to find, you know, putting bathrooms in a shelter area in the middle of it, and then how we did it to make it look like a barn to fit in with the, you know, the, uh, the Vista. I, all of that came through the CIP. But uh, those are the types of things I think about when I think about this process. Mark, I think it's helpful if you take some time to go through the project sheets and pay attention to the dates at the top. Like, I'm looking at one for Twin Brooks. That's 2018 to 2022. That project hopefully is sort of wrapping up. Um, it was a trail maintenance thing on the, the Tuttle Road side. The Wil oh, the Wilderness Trail on the Greeley Road side. It is not wrapping up. Sorry, I misspoke mm -hmm. because we need a culvert and we haven't put the culvert in yet. So, um, but it's been on the to-do list. This is like a to-do list. Things we need to do in town, and it just it just keeps us focused. Yeah, and I, that's, that's helpful for me to learn, but I, I, the, one of the reasons I'm asking it is because if there are folks at home that see a very a specific line for ARP funds being used for a particular project, and they say, well, hey, I, I would have hoped we would have used those funds for something else. Um, I just wanted to be clear that these aren't promises to fund this specific line item. This is this plan for the future um, that can be or cannot be changed if, if need be in the future. Is that, is it a, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, and it's kind of why we held off the ARP funds until the very end of the budget process, too, to see what you actually did fund and see what's left over. So we'll be talking about that in the next budget meeting uh, mo next Monday night. Okay. Thank you. I, I think I agree with you, Mike. It, it, it's a little confusing and it's a little... Um, it, you, you worry about what kind of message you're sending by saying, well, this is what we did, and, and then somebody says, well, this is what you said you were going to do, and it, it's really not, and uh, I guess uh, that comes down to the folks that, you know, a charter review is how uh, some of these things might be cleaned up in the future, but yeah. um, that doesn't get it off tonight's agenda. Well, you talk about the Brussel Road water line. That's been, that's in the comp plan. That's identified in the comp plan back to 2009. So that project has been around for a long time, mm -hmm. and uh, it has not been funded. So um, I think it just kind of reminds us that there's still more work to do out there. So um, I, I wish there was a better structure for it, Bob. I agree with you. I wish there was more of a, you know, this is a plan tool, and the council will review it occasionally to decide which is the next priority. But priorities change from year to year, depending on what happens in the community and how the community grows. So it's, it's tough to say this is the plan and this is what we're going to do in the next five years every year because we have a lot of responsibilities just in front of us, just between paving and equipment replacement and other we, things. We bought a lot of face masks and plexiglass. Yeah. So, so I did just have one follow-up kind of clarification question. Again, knowing that it's kind of the, the roadmap of where we, we would, we're considering going, um, is there a reason can you remind me, I know we talked about this in the past, but as to why ARP funds would potentially be used for maybe drainage or, or, or road paving projects, was that somehow to alleviate pressure in our TIF that then the TIF could 
be funded back up, or can you maybe clarify <clears throat> that a little bit? No, it, the if you remember the eligible categories that they gave us, they were pretty pretty limited, and uh, the eligible category for infrastructure was uh, water, sewer, storm drainage, and paving pavings I I ancillary to those three items. That's the only reason paving could be included. So those three items, uh, storm drainage, for instance, could be done. Uh, the water line planning as well as the construction could be used for ARP funds. Uh, they were very specific, and I think they were just trying to uh, promote more infrastructure work. So I guess what I'm getting at is if drainage is, is put in, you mentioned ancillary, if drainage is put in in a, in a particular location, I would presume as part of that drainage it would remedy, be paved. it would be paved, right? Correct. Okay, and that could be use those funds as it's part of the same project? Correct. Okay, so in other words, then that alleviates our need to use paving funds where maybe an additional source of revenue might have paid for those. Okay. Absolutely. So th I think that helps me clarify. Absolutely. That. Okay. So, a motion would be in order. Mr. Chairman, I'll give you a motion. I move to accept the proposed capital improvement plan for physical years 2022 through 2027 as recommended by the planning board. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the proposed capital improvement plan. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? This time it's unanimous. All right, next item on the agenda is 22 035 to set the week of May 16th to 20th for spring bulky item pickup week. Uh, so moved. There we go. Uh, this is a biennial uh, event, and on the town's website and the town crier will be. Notifications given for what we can and can't do, and um, anyways, um, need a second. Other than that, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Unless you just moved to town last week. Um, motion, uh, a second. A second has been made by Mr. Carp. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. 22-036 uh, to reappoint William Longley as code enforcement officer and Dan Small as alternative from April 1st, 2022 to March 31st, 2023. So moved. So moved. Uh, so second. I'd second that. Nope. We'll give Mark the second. Uh, <laughs> again, housekeeping uh, item for t this evening. Uh, our code enforcement officer and Dan Small as the alternative alternate when uh, Mr. Longley is not available. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion carries unanimous. And item 22-037, to appoint a member to the Lands and Conservation Commission and the Forestry Subcommittee. And if I get down to that. Um, One item. position line. It's here someplace. Uh, the career. Uh, I know it's here. There we go. Just sailed by it. And uh, anyways, the uh, this is to uh, uh, for Denny Gallaudet uh, is the applicant. And anyways, Denny has been uh, involved with a, a wide range of activities in the community, uh, not to mention the uh, solar project that we have currently. And he has volunteered to help with the solar project uh, for the school. Very capable candidate. Uh, so, anyways, uh, the motion would be to uh, 
You've got two positions there, Mr. Chair. You have one for the forestry oh, subcommittee right. and I'm one sorry. for the lands yeah. and conservation. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe Ron will give it to you because he's the nominating committee. <laughs> Mr. Yes. Chairman, I'll give you a motion to appoint uh, Denny right. Gallaudet to the Lands and Conservation Commission and Todd Ontel to the Forestry Subcommittee. Both are very qualified candidates and uh, welcome aboard both of them. Second. Motion made. Second. Any discussion? Welcome aboard, as you say. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. That, that concludes our official business for this evening. Now we get on to the fun stuff. Uh, new business. Mark, have you got anything? Well, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, the new business I'd like to report tonight is uh, kind of carrying out some of the plans we talked about earlier on action item one with the state legislature over the, the next coming uh, term, if you will, um, trying to make sure that we move some type of senior property tax deferral program forward. I know there's going to be a heavy lift there with, the, with our team to get that done, and so I'd like to focus a lot on that in the coming months. So that's, that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you. Shirley. I have a couple of items. Um, first of all, I'm wondering if we have any combined meetings with North Yarmouth and the school board during this budget process. We, as a town council, attended the school budget presentation last Monday night instead of doing our normal budget workshop work. And I do have some questions and comments to make and wondering about how the most efficient way to do that is, just let, as a normal citizen, I guess, at this point. I want to say there's a joint meeting. Uh, Bill should yes, next down. week. Um, um, I think it, they tried to schedule it. It had to be rescheduled. Uh, North Yarmouth had some conflicts trying to get to town meeting and getting their process wrapped up. They're in a much tighter window than we are. So there were a couple meetings scheduled that Jeff had scheduled, and then they had to um, cancel those at the last minute. I don't know of any coming right up. Okay. Were we going to talk about issues that we as a council had concerns about? I know that you and Allison spoke at the meeting, and we gave you sort of our questions, but we didn't really give have the opportunity to give feedback. What do you think? We can do that right you now? You can think or? about it. Well, I don't want to do it without them present because I don't want to feel like I'm going behind their back with my concerns. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, a message from Allison who was unable to be here due to uh, child care um, troubles, which plague the planet, I think, these days. Um, she would like to remind everybody that the survey is due April 15th. Um, I would like to uh, comment that last week, our meeting in West Cumberland, I was super impressed. Bill said 90, I think it was closer to 120. I counted the chairs, and I counted the chairs around the room, and I looked at how many people were out in the lobby, just fortunately very tall people out in the lobby trying to see in, and uh, a lot of positive feedback for that. I'm hopeful for that project. Um, and my final thing is a congratulations to Springbrook Farm for their very successful Maple, S Maple Sunday um, yesterday. It was great to see the draft horses going up and down Greeley Road, picking up people, bringing them to the farm, and it was just pretty much nonstop. Um, and while I'm thinking about Springbrook Farm, I would like to send out my thoughts and prayers to the Fowler family as they um, deal with you know, Greg's illness and, and his final moments. It's not easy, and Greg was um, steadfast in our community, and I'm thinking of him. Good family. That's all I have. A couple of things. Uh, Food pantry is doing well, and I do thank the volunteers that that have uh, contributed so much to us. Um, I don't know if you have people know this, but uh, I uh, 
tried out for the Villanova basketball team. And I didn't make it. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> How did that happen, you know? So uh, I uh, was very, very disappointed. And I was uh, actually uh, escorted off the campus <laughs> because I was so upset. And they didn't even call my name. And uh, so that was that. Was that. So uh, go Nova. That's all I have. You give new definition to March Madness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You let us know who those people responsible for that was, and we'll take care of them. That's, that's <laughs> just, uh, just, not, yeah. not, just not right, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I would say that Michael Jordan also got cut from his high school team, so keep Did your head really? up. Yeah. Yeah. Mike? Um, I've got on the schedule, Brenda, a joint committee for the 13th of April. Is that... Okay, that's all I have. Thanks. Here's my $20 for the 4-H food pantry, which I continue to support, Mr. Stiles, for giving me thumbs up in the audience. Uh, very worthy cause. And I would like to thank the 90-plus people that showed up last Tuesday night at the West Cumberland Community Hall. That meeting was very well attended, and everybody was very respectful. I mean, I thought the meeting went exceptionally well, and I look forward to seeing what happens. So. A lot of great in input from everybody. Everybody. I mean, and, and it was standing room only. There were a lot of people that were out in the hall that really couldn't see and couldn't hear very well, but I tried to get everybody to move into the room, but it was it was very well received, and I want to thank everybody. So that's all I have. Well, I, I concur. That, that was, it was a great meeting. There was, there was great input, uh, positive feedback, and, uh, you know, it's it's... When a town has a vision for where they see themselves, it's it's uh, it, it it says something about the community you live in. It's uh, you know this is not a dead community that just uh, uh, isn't doing anything uh, on so many fronts. We're we're doing a lot of things, uh, doing some interesting things, uh, and uh, so I mentioned that we were going to have a workshop. Um, uh, there is a possibility that. Uh, we've talked about senior housing for the last most of this year. Uh, there is a, as a possibility that we will have something concrete to discuss about that issue also. That, uh, uh, not to let the cat out of the bag or anything like that, but I think we have some exciting news to share with you soon, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, Bob, Mike is right. April 13th was the date we set for a joint standing committee for North Yarmouth and us. Do we want to see if we can get some of the school board members in? We were trying to give the new manager a little bit of time to get her feet underneath her, but I'll ask if they can still do that. If they could do that, maybe at least a few school board members might be able to attend. I, I'm just throwing it out there because we don't have any items that are you know hot on the front burner for that meeting. So, any thoughts there? I think any time we can engage a school board uh, okay. as a, as a three-way group is is time. We do those typically at five, Brent. The, those meetings, five o'clock on a Wednesday, and that that Mike was absolutely right. It, it was the thirteenth. Uh, the other the other issue is that you had told me to <laughs> schedule a solar group meeting this Wednesday night. I sent out the notice and everybody panicked because nobody's ready. <laughs> so they've asked for a little bit more time to appoint more people. I think our side is ready to go, and I shared I, that. I've got others. I've got some names I meant to give okay. you earlier. See, no, that's okay. I just want to say that originally you, we had scheduled for Wednesday night, and when I sent out the invitation, everybody went into a panic. So we may have to wait for a couple more weeks. I would like, Bill, if we get, we have that joint standing committee, I'd like to get a feel from the council where they are on having a, a discussion on sharing services. I know what, friend George Turn is out in the audience, and I don't know how many times we've, we thought we were moving forward and we weren't, and the, the council out there is, um, it's, it's like this. So no. it would be nice just to get a feeling where they, where they, if they have an interest in, Discussing shared services. So. Moving ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it's time to tell people it's we're 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 going to make a concrete proposal, and we expect you to make a concrete proposal. And uh, yep.
All right, that's all I've got, unless anybody else has anything. Um, so moved. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. There we go. All in favor? Good night, Irene. Thank you.